uh, will talk to us next, and um, she is a neuroscientist by training, but in 2007 is founded, together with other people, Frontiers as a publisher, <coughs> and um, she will talk about some of the things we can do in the internet age to get hold of all this information that's sort of we heard in the last presentation is sort of too much to handle and how we find our ways through that. Can I be really cheeky and make a couple of announcements? Um, I see that we've got a few um, latecomers um, joining us at the back there. We are running out of room. Um, if you'd like to go and get a seat, there is an overflow room. Um, so if you go back through um, the lounge, um, then you can sit in the Franks and Steel room and we will be live streaming um, the uh, keynote speeches there into the, but there, yes, but there are seats down here and stuff as well. So yeah, you know, come down, don't be shy, see if there is space, um, and if there isn't, anybody else arriving, um, you know, please do move out into the overflow room. Um, but the other thing is, is that it is Remembrance Sunday today, um, as we are aware, um, and we would like to observe the two-minute silence at 11 a.m. So um, we will break at 11 before that. <coughs> Wow, well, I think it's uh, quite difficult to follow such a witty, witty lecture as Ben has given. But it's been as well a, quite a summary of what I'm going to talk about, and as Martin as well introduced. And it's really providing this dissemination platform for scientists, where science is aggregated. That's basically what Frontiers is doing. So as Martin said, I'm a neuroscientist. I'm a working neuroscientist. I work on autism research at the EPFL in Switzerland. And in this talk, I'm going to give you a somewhat subjective perspective of how we at Frontiers see science and science publishing in general evolving in the internet age. And in the second part of the talk, I'm going to give you an example of how we introduce all of these internet trends into one coherent platform. So there were 1.5 billion computer users, 1 billion smartphone users, over 2.5 billion people have now internet access. So we are truly living in this information society that Martin has as well been talking about. Access to knowledge is really at our fingertips. And this instantaneous access to knowledge is as well transforming uh, science at a very accelerated uh, uh, pace. So the PhD student of today really has to uh, is, is fluent in, in the internet, basically. Researches papers on the internet, researches databases on the internet, knows multiple softwares online and offline, uh, speaks not only English, but as well at the best a couple of programming languages. And um, basically, the scientists of today are turning into these cyber scientists, and um, this is really pushing science as well into this open, open space. And I'm going to spend a couple of uh, slides uh, just um, explaining what we see as the major internet trends and how they are making science more open and more collaborative overall. So scientists have always shared the information throughout history. I mean, like, that's a, that's a normal thing, right? But the social web really, really has accelerated this entire process. So while about, um, well, I mean, like everybody knows Facebook, this is just an example, by no means exhaustive of what the social web actually is. But everybody knows Facebook. Um, it's the number one website on the internet. More or less 20% of the web traffic are going to Facebook nowadays. And what about two or three years ago, there were, and I've been monitoring this quite closely, there were quite a few scientists on, on Facebook. Today, everybody is there. And we're using the space not just to communicate our private or personal information, our pictures and so on, but as well to really transmit science. So research papers are being put up there, and people are trying, scientists are trying to hold discussions in this uh, space as well. But Facebook as well as um, LinkedIn are probably still too mainstream. They're not necessarily catering towards the needs of these scientists. They're not fostering this um, uh, discourse, the scientific discourse. So a lot of academic networks have as well been popping up over the last couple of years, and there will probably many more be popping up over the next couple of years as well. And we at Frontiers have as well popped one this year. 
Um, and what these academic networks basically do is um, to foster towards the needs of the scientists. They basically display academic profiles with CVs and they um, showcase what's most important to scientists and those are their publications. Yet there has been this rumor around in tech forums and on internet sites that uh, scientists are quite conservative and that they don't really engage into networking. <laughs> And in fact, I have been believing this rumor because before we started the network, we actually asked our users what they think about networking. And in our case, users are editors. Those are quite high profile people. Many of them as well already a little bit more senior. And um, well, on the internet, internet, probably everybody over 30 is a bit more senior. But um, these are quite established scientists. So when you ask them, you know, like, oh, do you need a network? Do you want one? They usually say, you know, like, not really. Networking is a big waste of time. They don't see a value uh, in it. They're quite suspicious of Facebook. But, well, we anyways went ahead. We were quite optimistic, and we launched the Frontiers Research Network anyways. And what happened immediately was that article views went up by 30%. PDF downloads as well increased by around 30%. Profile views of uh, academics increased by around 80%, and the page views as well increased by around 70%. So there was an immediate value where the network acted as a distribution system in order to enhance what matters, and that is the research articles and their authors. So it ramped up visibility immediately. And then I looked at... Um, at um, the, the engagement of the users. So, I mean, you can look at it at, as a percentage of monthly active users. Those are the people that log in at least once a, once a month into the network. And obviously, Facebook is huge. It's got a 95% uh, monthly user, 95% uh, of monthly active users. And then when you look at Twitter and LinkedIn, they're around 30%. And if you look at the network data, such as academia, and more recently as well in Frontiers, it's as well around 30%. So it's not really true that these users are not engaging with, uh, with the networks. They're actually quite willing to do so if you provide them the right platform for it. And I'm going to talk about the network a little bit later and how we cu couple it with open access publishing. So, but obviously the networks, they act as a distribution system for, for information and for scientific knowledge, but there are many, many, many more social sites out there on the internet. Um, libraries uh, such as uh, ReadCube or Mendeley, they allow people to collaboratively uh, put papers together, put them together in libraries and share them amongst each other. Um, but there is, well, databases um, such as PubMed or Archive or others that um, uh, aggregate these papers and allow people to access them freely. Um, there's, well, a lot of open access publishers coming up, and there's a whole explosion, actually, of open access journals coming up in the last couple of years. But people, as well, uh, use online tools to write together, such as Google Docs, which we use in the lab uh, a lot, um, as well in Frontiers. Um, the people write Wikipedia together. It's the sixth most accessed website on the internet. People share files with each other, not anymore by arcade methods such as uh, email, but they use Dropbox and Google Drive for it. And there's obviously so many multimedia sites out there. Um, lectures are no longer, as you can see in this example, held in, in behind closed doors. They're live streamed, put up onto YouTube. Um, Figures and, and data sheets are shared on Figshare, whole presentations, are, scientific presentations are shared on SlideShare, images on Flickr, and so forth and so on. So the social web is really fostering this collaboration and sharing and accelerating the entire process of science and pushing it into this open space. And then there are the services that boost this entire process as well. So, for example, there are services to write papers, to help you with your graphics, with your animations, to put up a PowerPoint presentation. All of education and training is, in fact, moving into the online space. Many prestigious universities are now offering online video courses, so somebody in Africa can, can watch a 
in course on biochemistry at Stanford University. This is great. Lab equipment can be compared and auctioned online. Software development can be outsourced. Projects uh, between many groups worldwide can be managed online um, with uh, things like JIRA, for example. Lab experiments, lab books can be shared with uh, software like LabGuru. And there's a whole explosion of databases, as Ben has as well been talking about, um, where people can come together they insert data and they analyze data on a much bigger data set than just in their own lab, which leads to many more insights. But in fact, you don't even need PhD students anymore. You can nowadays, <laughs> whether it's good or bad, you know, like any one of us can judge personally, I guess. Um, but you can outsource whole experiments and you can find these companies um, via aggregator sites on the internet as well. So there are great companies that are specialized in, for example, animal behavior experimentation, genetic analysis, electrophysiology, and so forth and so on. So services are really boosting, accelerating the process of science and as well helping to push it into this open space. Yet there's another driver that makes us more collaborative and this is what we call big science or industrial scale science. And this in itself creates an entire space on the internet as well, which calls for online tools to organize data, to manage protocols, to manage people and collaborators, and so forth. And this is happening more and more. Let me give you an example. Henry's mentioned already the Human Brain Project. So the uh, European Union launched a big science initiative called the Flagship Projects, and there are currently six finalists in this, um, in this project. And next year, two of those six will be awarded 1 million euros over a course of 10 years' time. So one of these finalists is the Human Brain Project. Its goal is to simulate the human brain in exquisite biological detail from gross anatomical structures really down to gene expression in the single synapse. But the goal is not just to simulate the human brain. It's also to really create an IT infrastructure where people can come in, neuroscientists from all over the world, insert the data, analyze and simulate it within this framework of this brain. And this really, you know, like is, is the ultimate in collaboration and putting it out for everybody there in an open space. And as I mentioned, these big science projects, they are happening now more and more. And they're fueled by the rise of supercomputers. And this gives rise to a whole new generation of, of science that, that really brings people together. OK, so let's look now at the publishing trends as, as we see them as well coming and happening on the internet, um, but as well in the entire science publishing industry. So um, we identified, or we think of three trends as, as particularly important. There's, of course, the open access movement. Then there is the peer review, which really lies at the heart of the scientific collaboration. And then there is impact evaluation. How do we evaluate science, and how do we evaluate scientists? And that as well requires a little bit of fixing. So open access is really at the heart of science. It means that articles, research articles, once they're published, they're put into, in, they're, that they're then freely available to anybody in the world to read. The copyrights mainly remain in, with the authors, and this is as opposed to the more traditional subscription-based um, uh, publishing, where the costs are with the subscribers, the readers, and one has to pay to access the articles. So in this model, in the open access model, the costs are basically shifting from the reader to the author. And this open access movement, as you probably all know, was started by librarians and influenced by two trends. First of all, the costs of the journals were rising and rising, and nobody could afford anymore. Not even the wealthiest libraries uh, could afford access to all the journals. And then it was really as well fueled by the digital age in itself. That means everybody had now access to computers, papers were now available in electronic formats, and they could be instantly distributed via the internet. So you don't really need it, the printing process anymore. You didn't need anymore to hold this uh, journal in your hands. 
no van had to deliver it anymore to your, to your doorstep. You could download it directly from the internet. And open access is happening. Um, this is a recent study published by um, uh, Laxo and Björk um, this year, and it shows the rise of open access papers. So in um, 2011, they reached around 350,000 <coughs> open access papers published. It's happening across all disciplines. In biomedicine, it is most prominent, but it's also happening in the humanities, in engineering, chemistry, and so forth. It's happening across the entire globe, from Europe down to Africa. And the gap between the, this is an older study, a different study, the gap between the subscription articles and the open access articles is becoming smaller every year because the, the rate at which the open access articles are growing is faster, basically, than the subscription-based growth rate. So open access is happening and seems to be quite uh, unstoppable. Let's look at the peer review, which really lies at the heart of the scientific collaboration. So here, scientists are evaluating scientists, each other's work, basically. And there's quite wide consensus that this is not working as it was supposed to work and as the great idea about the peer review was. First of all, there is a lot of subjectivity. So there are a few gatekeepers that decide about the fate of paper. Usually it's a managing editor and a few reviewers, one to three reviewers, to decide whether this article should be published or not published. So obviously this is quite a subjective process. And there's quite a lot of bias in it because the people that are judging the paper are usually experts working in the very same field as the authors. And they're competing for the same grant money. So it might very well be that it is not in their interest that this particular author is now publishing an article in Nature or in Science at this moment in time. And history is full, really, of, of, of examples and anecdotes, not just history, but really everyday life, where uh, papers are blocked in order to preserve paradigms, dogmas, or self-interests. But as well, this entire process is hugely inefficient. We live in this digital age. I've been presenting these online tools. Yet journals and publishers are not using these online tools and the software that we have nowadays available uh, in order to acceler accelerate the peer review process. Mostly this is done still in quite archaic uh, things. Um, which leads to um, um, a delay in the review process. Yes.
So let me continue. <coughs> Let's look at impact, which really lies at the heart of um, scientific careers. Careers are based on article publications, where one publishes determines the career. The higher the impact of the journal where one publishes, the steeper a scientific career is. Because as a matter of fact, universities and employers still look at where one publishes, because this one facilitates um, the decision-making process. It's as simple as that. And obviously, this is kind of just wrong, right? Scientists are, ba are evaluated based on the prestige of the journal, and not necessarily what they're, uh, what they're publishing, how many citations they got, uh, what the reach of their paper was, and so forth. And this is turning scientists as well, and researchers, academics in general, into, into lobbyists, into networkers, but in a, in a bad way. Because they have to lobby to get their articles in into these high, high impact journals. And then obviously there are as well all the disadvantages that come with a monopoly. Currently there is only one company out there that determines the journal impact factors for every publisher and every journal out there in the world. And I can assure you out of experience this is far from a transparent or democratic process. So we have to, we have to change that and there is a whole movement going on out there. To, to put this back and refocus this on the research itself rather than the journals. And um, this as well, this movement of article level metrics looking at the article itself exploits as well the latest internet technologies. So one can look at citations, one can view, uh, look at views and downloads, but one can as well look at the social relevance of papers, um, the spread across the internet, such as our metrics do, our impact story, and, and several others. And if you combine this with academic profiles, you can actually as well look at uh, demographics and social and knowledge graphs. So who's, what kind of people are reading papers and so forth. And we at Frontiers have been implementing that since since our existence, basically, since three, four years, and many others, such as PLOS, Altmetric, Impact Story, and the others that uh, are working on that, and they recently had a conference, uh, are working on exactly these same things as well. So like, let's look at this. I mean, like there are these, these internet trends that are coming together, the publishing trends that are coming together, and this poses serious challenges to the publisher of today. It is not enough anymore to just publish papers. The publisher of tomorrow actually needs to meet all of these different needs of the scientists of tomorrow, or you can even say of today, and provide a platform for innovation to integrate all of these different trends that we see on the internet and that we see in the publishing industry to better serve scientists and to improve how, how we as scientists are as well doing our science, to accelerate this process, to boost creativity. And this is what, what our mission at Frontiers basically is. And um, in this part of the talk, I'm going to show you what, what it is that we're doing at Frontiers to bring these web friends together. So our, our mission was basically to, to tackle the following things. So first of all, open access. We think that access to knowledge is, is really a basic human right. So this is, um, this is the foundation of it all. Peer review, we thought a lot about it because it really lies at the heart of scientific uh, collaboration. So we thought that it required some fixing. We introduced networking into the entire game because networking really acts as a distribution platform for scientific ideas, for scientific research, and it unleashes creativity on the system. And we as well try to provide services in order to empower scientists and accelerate their science. So let me explain this a little bit uh, in more detail. So at the bottom of it really lies an IT platform for innovation. So that means that we harvest the lat or we try at least to harvest the latest web technologies, internet trends, trends in computer science, and bring it together in one platform. So it's really not just about publishing papers, it's about building intelligent software as well to bring it all together. And this platform is divided into two components. One is the publishing platform and one is the community platform. 
And as I mentioned before, at the bottom or at the heart of the publishing platform lies open access. This is basic. But it is not all. There are many more things to publishing. So the journals that we are building are community-based, which means that they're anchored on an academic taxonomy to allow community building. Um, but they're as well run by big editorial, external editorial boards of top scientists. And then um, peer review, we try to make it more collaborative, more interactive, more efficient as well by using latest, um, by using software basically to, 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 to help it. We provide article impact uh, metrics, and we use these article impact metrics to promote the best science in, in a process, what we call uh, democratic tiering, to higher visibility. At the bottom uh, of the community platform really lie online tools for researchers and for communities. So we, we provide rich academic profiles that go far beyond um, CVs and publication lists. There are many more things that you can add to a profile. Um, ben was mentioning it, blogs. So blogs have to be integrated into such a profile. Video lectures have to be integrated into such a profile. And many more things, and I'm going to give you examples of this. And then there are the services. And at the very, very bottom of it lies the dedication to build sustainable and responsible business models. So currently all of this is based on the, on the normal open access model of where authors are, are, are bearing the publication costs. But our vision really lies uh, in the model which we call the equal access model, where ultimately both the reader as well as the author can read and, and publish articles for free. And this means harvesting alternative revenue streams. And this is more the long-term or middle-term vision that we're trying to employ at Frontiers. And then there's a complete integration between these platforms. So in fact, it's not even two platforms, just to, you know, like as an example, I'm explaining it like that, but it's really one thing. So articles from the journal system are flying directly into, into the community platform, are distributed by the networking uh, modules, and profiles from the community uh, site are as well accessible on each single article page and throughout the entire system, basically. So to go into this into a little bit uh, more detail, so community-based and high quality basically means that, um, journal, that the journals are driven by these large editorial boards of world-renowned scientists. And this is important that um, these are top scientists because we believe that quality attracts quality. The peer review and publication decisions are taken care of by the external editorial staff, so by the scientists themselves and not by Frontiers staff. What Frontiers really provides is the platform, the opportunity, and the support for publishing, but the responsibility for publishing, this really lies in the hands of the scientists. So this is how it works. A field journal, like for example, neuroscience or physiology or cardiology, <coughs> is um, usually run, but not necessarily always, by a field chief editor. So this is one of these high-profile scientists. Um, and it then has um, around it, it's composed of many specialties. These specialties are as well run by our high-profile scientists. We call them the specialty chief editors. Around these are the associate editorial boards. These are the people who manage the peer review. And around these are big review editorial boards. These are the people who review the uh, articles. And such a field can be composed of many different uh, specialties. Specialties can be as well shared amongst different fields to facilitate um, integration and communication between different fields as well. And maybe as a side note, we don't call these journals mega journals. It's, as there is as well this, this, this word now out there, and it's a trend in publishing. We really call them community journals, and for two reasons. Because A, they're anchored on this um, academic taxonomy, so they really allow um, niche building. And they're run by these big editorial boards. So we really see a journal, a community journal, as a social phenomenon. These are just some facts. So currently there are around 25,000 editors. We have around 12 different field journals and across 200 different specialty sections. This is growing. We're launching many more this year and next year. 
There are around 8,500 articles that were already published, half of that this year. So again, we're accelerating in growth. Currently, there are around 4.3 million page views, and it took us around four years to become uh, sustainable, which I think in open access is, uh, is quite a record time. And um, this is despite the fact that we have invested a lot into the platform and that we are as well headquartered in Switzerland, where quality of living is quite high and salaries are high. And the reason why it actually worked is because we did build this software that allows us to be flexible and scalable. So let's look at the, at the peer review now, which was really important and which was one of the driving forces why Frontiers actually came into life. So we first of all changed the mandate to objective um, issues. We think that science should be evaluated not by two or three people, but by whole crowds of experts. Okay, so let's take the evaluation out of the process and let's focus the review really on um, is, this, um, is this valid science. And then um, the review mandate as, as well requires unanimous decision to accept or to reject uh, papers. So everybody has to agree. The associate editor has to agree. The reviewers have to agree. This paper is OK for acceptance, or this paper is not OK for acceptance, and it has to be rejected. It is collaborative, the peer review is collaborative and interactive. That means that the authors and the reviewers can interact in this online review forum and they have a very quick exchange of uh, comments and uh, reviews on the paper. So that is what makes it quite efficient. Um, the review templates are standardized, so we facilitate it for the reviewers. They don't have to get into a stream of consciousness. They just have to follow a set of questions that guide them through the review process. It's quite efficient because in the background there are all of these workflows and software uh, uh, procedures that guide authors and reviewers through the tasks that they need to do. And then finally, and this was probably the hardest one, at the end of it, the reviewers are, are revealed on the, their, their identities revealed on the paper. So we put the names onto the paper um, that is published. And the reason for that was twofold. First of all, we want to recognize the reviewers for their work. They are contributing to this paper. They are investing a significant amount of uh, time. Uh, and effort into it, so we, we think they should be acknowledged and recognized for this work. But on the other hand, we as well wanted to encourage constructiveness and responsibility in the review process. So that's one of the reasons why we acknowledge or show the reviewer names on the papers. So let me just quickly guide you through this process. So all of this is happening online, okay? There's no offline process here. Everything is happening in, in, in this, um, on the website, basically. Articles are submitted. Once they are submitted, basically the reviewers are assigned. And we, here we have two ways. So on the one hand, we are matching. We're using an algorithm that matches the keywords from the publications with the keywords of the reviewers. And we invite those reviewers that are relevant for these, uh, for these uh, papers. But this process can as well always be overridden by uh, manual intervention. So the associate editors can always come and uh, invite reviewers themselves. But it hugely accelerates the entire process. And then uh, what follows is what we call the independent review. So once the reviewers are assigned, they're getting into the forum, they're getting their standardized review templates, they're replying to this, submitting it. And um, this, is, this is happening as well independent of each other. It means that the reviewers don't know what the other reviewer is writing or saying. Then the uh, associate editor comes in, reads through this, and decides to activate the interactive review. And this is, this is the time when the authors then come in, immediately see the review reports, and start replying to it. So in, in theory, this can actually happen in real time almost. So they come in, they reply, then the reviewers get a notification, reply as well. And uh, it does lead to quite an acceleration of the process. In case there is disagreement, more reviewers can be, can be invited. But in order to reject a paper, everybody has to agree that this paper is below any standard and it cannot be uh, accepted. So we don't make it easy. 
But it's not, you know, like to accept more papers. That's not the reason for it. It's the reason why we didn't make it easy to reject a paper was really to protect the rights of the authors. Because we as authors as scientists know that it's very easy to get a paper rejected and then we we fret over it for for days and weeks. So we try to protect the rights of the authors. Everybody has to agree to reject a paper and the chief editor takes the final decision. But if there is consensus and everybody agrees that this paper should be accepted, then we do accept it and the names of the reviewers are disclosed. And at that point in time, the article is pushed into the production forum, um, which as well is online. It's just a matter of a click and then the production, our production office and the typesetters come in and produce the PDFs, XMLs, HTMLs, and then it's distributed to PubMed, Crosswork, and wherever. All of this process is maximally standardized with workflows that push and alert people and tell them what to do. And um, this makes it as well quite fast. So on average, it takes around three, three months to publish a paper from submission until the final, until the final uh, PDF is online. So what happens after the article is uh, published? Then it goes online, and that's when the evaluation starts. And in Frontiers, really, this is a democratic process. This is where the article level metrics kick in. And this is a perspective of how an author, I don't know how well you can see that, but it's a perspective of how an author would see their article evolving. So they can see from where in the world people are accessing it, what are the top viewing countries, <laughs> sites, and um, how is the paper evolving basically over time. And since we as well have academic profiles integrated into the, into the website, we can as well give more detailed analysis on demographics. So what kind of people are reading these papers? From what fields are they coming? Are these the same fields as you're working in, or maybe different ones which could indicate you know, like that this is socially relevant, this paper, if not just your, your, your couple of peers and experts in the very same uh, area are looking at it. It also tells you um, uh, what kind of positions uh, people have. This, are these professors that are looking at your paper, PhD students, and all kinds of things that you can play with, like gender and age. It's fun, basically. Maybe not so important, the gender or age. And then what happens? So these article level metrics, they, they run on the articles for quite a, for a period of time. And then we take the highest impact articles and we basically suggest them to the chief editors. Okay, the most read and viewed and accessed uh, papers are then suggested to the chief editors. They check them. And if they okay them, then we invite the authors to write a, what we call a focused review. So that really puts the original discovery, the original research into a broader context. It puts it into a more general uh, language as well so that more people can access it uh, intellectually. And, and um, we then publish them as focused reviews and the article level metrics run on these focused reviews as well. And this is uh, quite a rewarding experience for the authors um, because they know that um, if they are invited for, for this focused review that many people have been reading their articles and it has been acknowledged by uh, many uh, of their peers. So let me just quickly show you the community platform. It's going to take five minutes or so. It consists, consists of profiles, research networking and services. So this is an example of an academic profile. You can always dig in into the buyer and read more about the CV. There as well the publications here, so you get the entire publication list, which we extract automatically from the internet. So you don't have to tediously upload it. You just need to confirm your publications. But it goes beyond CVs and publications. You can see the impact of the, of the person, so how many times has he been accessed, how many times have he, this, his internal frontiers and external frontiers, uh, non-frontiers publication been viewed, and so forth. Um, but you can as well see who's following, um, in this case, Idan. What kind of lectures is he giving? So here he's giving a lecture in I don't know where. Um, what uh, events he's organizing as well. So we as scientists obviously organize a lot of seminars, conferences, workshops, and so forth. So these have to be as well some, uh, distributed somewhere and made known, um, not just by email. And as well, what kind of research topics um, are they um, producing and organizing? 
Uh -huh. And it all comes together in this personal activity stream, so that really shows the scientific, the scientific life of the person. I mean, like if you want to upload your baby pictures here, you can, but it's really about the scientific life. So what is he publishing? What events is he organizing? Here he's publishing a book, basically. Here a research topic, an article, and so forth. And then, you know, like you have all the networking features that are usual on a, on a network. You can follow researchers easily. So um, we have quite a lot of, a lot of high profile scientists uh, on the network because we are a journal as well and because we have these top quality editorial boards. So you can follow quite interesting people on the network. But you can as well follow keywords. So for example, if you're researching schizophrenia, you're interested in schizophrenia, but you don't, maybe you're a PhD student or so, and you don't know yet all the people that are working in schizophrenia. So you just want to follow the term schizophrenia and get updates around uh, publication, events, blogs, news around schizophrenia. So you can do that. And it, this as well happens automatically on the platform. So once you register and confirm a couple of publications, we know your keywords and we switch this on automatically for you. And if you don't like it, you can always switch it off or refine the search, but it saves time basically. And then everything comes together in the activity stream. Okay. And this is, this is where, where you get this aggregator basically. And you can see what people are publishing, what they're up to, and you can see what's happening in your field of expertise or, or interest, basically. I think I have to wait until it stops. Yeah. So I think I can say with quite, uh, quite some confidence that Frontiers is the first and only platform that really combines open access publishing with research networking. And what it does is really, the networking platform acts as this distribution and dissemination system for scientific knowledge. And what it does really is increase immediately the visibility of the scientific knowledge, be it articles or be it other non-article scientific content, and of the authors, of the people who are producing this scientific content. And it distributes it as well to the right niches, actually. So these are just um, I'm, I'm almost at the end. These are the a couple of examples of the services of many I've been talking about, but maybe to mention as well, apart from jobs that you can as well post on the website, is events. Um, events is um, not just that you can post of these events that I'm organizing this conference or the seminar and, uh, and that, but you can actually invite people to it. It's a whole software in itself where you can invite people to it, really organize the event online. And um, as well, we many times produce abstracts for an event. So we invite people to, when we organize as a scientist an event, we invite people to as well submit abstracts. So you can manage this entire abstract uh, submission and review and publication process as well um, in, this, in this system. And then, <laughs> Many times, you know, like people ask something like, why are you guys bothering? Why do we need yet another network? Aren't there enough networks out there? Why, why are you building this community uh, platform? And this really is the reason for it. So this is the, the, and I think quite a compelling one. This is the story of one of our chief editors, Kendall Smith. And he gave a, a talk on the quantum <coughs> theory of immunity. And this talk was posted on YouTube last year in the summer. And there it got uh, 225 views. Okay, YouTube most, second most, or third most access website in the world where everybody posts videos. And then this same talk around the same time was actually put onto Frontiers as well. And there it got almost 12,000 views. So basically where this comes together is um, this community platform really allows the formation of niches, okay? And this niches were, it's in the, within these niches where, where the specialized knowledge is ramped up in terms of its visibility. And this is exactly what we want to achieve, distribution and dissemination of scientific ideas. Thank you very much.
think they're great tools. publishing. So you had that, that slide where you sort of it began with the submission. Mm -hmm. So I want to make a kind of a comment and a plug really. So for me, that, that what you had up there represents, yes. um, it was the, the slide where you started off with submission and then you kind of, that was the one, that'll be fine. So for me, that represents maybe at best perhaps 50%, perhaps maybe 25% of the process. As an author and as a scientist, it's the bit before that that I'm really interested in. So the bit where we write our Word documents and all the rest of it. That's the hard bit. And so my plea, I think, to the publishing community is what we need a bit more attention on, I think, is that bit before. How do we help structure our manuscripts? How do we help structure our content in such a way that we can easily more facilitate and streamline this process? So I said I had a plea and a plug. So um, I'm also the uh, uh, editor-in-chief of a new journal, Biodiversity Data Journal, which is basically about Yes. Basically, by creating a, a sort of very graphic workflow process where people can um, yeah, assemble and construct their data. And I think um, it's I heard about easy for my community to put focus on a particular topic, biodiversity data. It's much harder for the publishers who are trying to cover a, a really wide range of sections. But my generalized plea, I think, is that that's the bit where we need a bit more attention on that. Thing, I, think. I totally agree with you. Absolutely, I, I, I think so as well. It's just a matter of time, resources uh, to implement that. But yes, that's really where it all, I mean, it actually begins with the experiment in the lab, right? That you as well need to facilitate and, and provide the online tools. There are others that are doing it, but you need to provide the platform where you can easily find these tools as well. So that's what we're trying to do at Frontiers. But then the process of the of of, of writing this all up, organizing it, etc. So currently you still have to rely on, on Google Docs, I guess. Um, but I absolutely agree with you that as a publisher you need to take this into account as well. Yeah, it's not just, as I said, it's not enough to just publish the paper. Mm -mm. You have to provide all of these tools that a scientist needs in order to do a good job today. Maybe 10 years ago it was different. Um, hi, hello. Um, I am uh, my name's Ava. I'm community manager for the Node, which is a site for developmental biologists only. So I deal with a much smaller community. But um, you were showing the numbers of 30% monthly active users, and I wondered what is the actual um, recurring user number. So after a few months, how many of them are still using the Frontiers um, networking activities? Well, in our case, you know, like it's all intermixed, right? We have the journal structure, the editorial boards, people peer review, they do use the networking features and so forth, so they always come come back in our case. It's, um, I would have to look it up exactly, you know, like what it is, you know, like just disentangled for the networking space. Follow-up question. Um, in terms of recurring numbers, at least. And um, so it's really tied around the journals, so what is, is there is it useful for people who have not published in a Frontiers journal? Can they join? Is it yes, they can join very easily and, you, and just use, you know, like the that? other the other tools. Yes, you will in fact find many of the people. You see, I mean, like on the current networks, what 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 happens is. The academic networks they have to build up the high-profile scientists, and these are the more senior people, and they just don't go so easily to a network register there and say hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm here. But they do work as editors uh, in journals, so it's a combination what we're doing. We have them, we track them via the journals where they do the editorial work, and we expose them at the same time to these networking uh, features. And then slowly, slowly they start seeing the value in it. <laughs> Hi, 
to put some flesh on the bones of your diagram there, can you tell us the average number of interactive independent reviewers and your paper rejection rate? The paper rejection rate is around 15%, I think, 15 to 20%. And the review editorial boards, they currently are around, I would say, 23, 22,000 people. Oh, okay, that's two. On average, two? Well, not on average. It's The minimum number is two, but it can be more. Hi, um, Sarah Venice, Medical Editor, Medicines or Frontier. Um, I was just wondering about your democratic tiering process and how you account for papers that are just controversial and not necessarily the high end of science rising to the top. Is there any kind of qualitative... Review. Yeah, of course. I mean, like we take we take the articles um, that are currently. I mean, like you can build many more algorithms, but the most basic is obviously what is the most accessed uh, in terms of abstract views, full text views, PDF downloads. You can build an algorithm just out of that. Um, you can use then as well, you know, like other stuff like profiles combining with that in order to build different types of indices, but. What it comes down to, you know, like this is something that the internet gives you, but you always need a qualitative uh, process to look at that. So obviously, um, this is then given to the chief editors and the associate editors, and we ask, you know, like is this uh, is this valid? Would you, you know, like promote it um, up the tier? And if they say yes, then then we invite the authors. Yes. So there is a qualitative uh, process, a human interjection uh, in it. Yeah. I have a question regarding building a community around journals. Um, what are your thoughts on if, if every publisher does that and you have lots of separate communities, so you have also integration with broader communities that are not publisher specific or work with other publishers? Because if you're a schizophrenia researcher, you might look at many different places and might not necessarily be your community. Mm -hmm. How do you integrate with all those? Well, I think then ultimately what it comes down to is where are the most, where are the people in, in what side, right? I mean, uh, and, and who's providing the best tools? I think that's what it ultimately is going to, to boil down to. So um, the communities are going to foster and, and, and spring around the sites where they feel comfortable and where they feel enabled. And whether that's Frontiers or some other <coughs> site, we will have to see in the future, I would say. Um, but yes, that's why I'm as well here. We are trying to look uh, for people, for partners, uh, to, to foster this communication and the interaction as well, obviously, with other publishers. So I think well, there's one more question, David. I wonder if I could ask a more general question this time. Because of the decreased costs of online publication is now possible for publishers to set themselves up and spawn 100, 1,000 new journals in an instance. So the rate of publication of journal titles has increased dramatically in the last five years. Do you think this is sustainable? And if not, what's going to happen? I don't think this is sustainable at all. And I don't think that online publishing is actually much cheaper. Yes, the printing falls away, the distribution via van and plane falls away, but you do have to maintain editorial, uh, an editorial office, you do have to maintain server costs, you have to, in our case as well, maintain software. Building software is not cheap if you want to build high quality software, so the costs are shifting. It is probably cheaper than, than printing uh, articles, but there are still uh, costs involved in that. And I think, I, well, my personal opinion, you know, like there are so many of these journals coming up. You do have to be responsible towards the authors and the scientists. You can't just pop up a journal and say, now we're we are publisher and this is what we are doing. There is a lot behind it that, in, in terms of thought, infrastructure, software, teams that need to be set up in order to be responsible. So I don't think that all of the journals out there are sustainable in the end. So a lot of them are coming, sprouting up, but I think there will as well be a lot of cutting that we will see in the future. 
<laughs> so thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. For inviting me. So now comes one of the important, most important sessions of this conference, so that's the coffee break. We're running a little bit late, so we restart at 12. That's 15 minutes late. And the rest of the day is split into three different rooms. So you should pick the room you want to go back to um, during the coffee break.